Uh, well, great to, um, I, some of you I know, some of you I'm meeting. Um, nice to have you all here. Um, as Emily said, I'm Chris Gottlieb. Um, I teach the NYU Family Defense Clinic, which um, most often represents parents in family court, but has over the years um, uh, broadened its SCR practice um, because it is such a huge need for um, uh, clients that, that hasn't been met. I, couldn't be more thrilled that NDS, CFR, I think all four of the offices are going to be able to grow their SCR practices now. Um, I mean, they're already doing much more in terms of advice on SCR matters than used to happen before the institutional providers, and, and the idea that you guys can take on more is just, um, I think, really going to change the shape of the practice, especially with the law student help. So um, very excited about all of that. As I said, I'm not going to assume any <laughs> background. Um, I'm going to sort of start um, it, with, at the introductory level. Um, it is, if you, if, if you have touched the system at all, you already know that from a legal perspective, it's unusually opaque, that the laws um, and practices around it are, um, I think, quite confusing. So I'm going to do a fair amount of detail and a fair amount of law for those who are interested in that. But I also will really try... Um, I know that a lot of the work that's done and that really benefits clients is not done by lawyers, and I, I don't think you always need to get in the weeds. A lot of times just writing that letter is um, it, itself all you need to do to help the client. So I, I'm gonna, I, I, what I will do is try to highlight, even as I'm getting into the weeds sometimes, the kind of bigger points that I think really, if those are the ones you take away, um, I, 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 they're the ones I'm, I think will be most helpful. So um, I certainly don't want to um, push anyone away by giving you the more of the complication, but I wanted you to know it's here and you can go back to it in the slides or, or follow up with me. It's more To me, it's more about knowing enough so that when a case comes in, you can identify whether one of the recurring weird issues that comes up is coming up in that case, and then you can go figure it out, but like it, a, a way that you have enough to flag what the issues are. Um, so let's ju jump right in. Um, I do always like to start first by um, just giving an overview of what the state central register is for those who don't know. And there is a lot of misinformation floating around out there. I think our clients um, understandably um, have, they've been giving a lot of information that, that is misleading. And so um, the, the very basic intro is that there is a hotline set up required by statute in New York. Um, to take calls of suspected child abuse and neglect. And um, there are some people who are required to call if they have um, reasonable uh, cause to believe there might be abuse or neglect. Those are mandated reporters, which include teachers and uh, medical professionals and a, a sort of ever-growing uh, list of, of people who have contact with children. But you don't have to be a mandated reporter to call in. Anyone can. Um, and in fact, in New York, you can call in anonymously, something that um, some of us are trying to change. And I am going to sprinkle throughout this um, some uh, tidbits on the efforts that are underway that NDS, CFR, Bronx Defenders, and, and BDS have all been involved, um, as has the clinic, with pushing for some really, I think, important reforms. And I'm going to just mention them as we go along. And if anyone is interested in working on those, we would love to have assistance. So there is a bill pending now that would prohibit anonymous calls, um, which we like to think would do away with some of the harassing calls that we see. Um, it's not a secret, I don't think, among our clients that often um, people are maliciously calling in, whether it's a landlord who wants to give a tenant a hard time or an ex-partner um, who's using it as a way to, to harass um, neighbors, all, all kinds of badly intentioned calls uh, go in. Um, so um, the SCR is what we call the State Central Register. Um, and that's literally the database that's kind of keeping the information once the call goes in. Once a call goes in, that information is going to stay there. What it says about the case will depend on the investigation and on what happens in the appeal process, but it's going to stay in there for a significant amount of time, and we'll talk about how long um, once the call goes in. Um, uh, and it will include the allegations and the result of the allegations. Um, it will not include as much information as, it, as is in an ACS case record. We'll come back to what it's likely to include or not. Um, so a key a point um, is that the SCR is not publicly accessible. So there's been a lot of discussion in the 
media in recent years about um, sex offender registries. So I do think sometimes people mix them up. A sex offender registry, you can go online and look up uh, who in your neighborhood um, is uh, on the registry. That is not the case with the SCR. So it, they do strictly control who has access to anything um, that's in there. Um, uh, but many re employers are required to check there. So um, there, there's a long list in the statute of people who have access, child protective services, law enforcement, um, and then employers. Um, and the, so it's, it's important to understand it's not publicly accessible. It is limited access. On the other hand, the number of employers that are able to access it is, I think, far broader than um, our clients tend to, uh, to know. So people assume if I'm going to be a daycare provider or maybe a teacher, I'm going to be checked. And that's true, although in randomly weird sort of ways. I mean, there are teaching positions that don't check. But it is right to assume that if you're directly providing childcare or teaching, uh, that employer is going to check. But it's many, many others. And so, um, in a way, we've asked OCFS for a list of all employers who check. There is no such list. So kind of nobody really knows for sure. Um, but it does tend to include institutions that, um, that regularly serve children. So a lot of hospitals will check um, all their staff, like even a secretary who's not in the, the children's unit. So that person may not be thinking, of course, when she applies for a job that it's going to be checked. Janitors who work in um, uh, institutions that have children or um, bus drivers, it just it ends up being a very broad range of jobs. And in some ways, um, most important for our clients um, is many, hey, hi. <laughs> um, uh, um, the, the, is, is that so many home health aid agencies check. Um, and I mention that because, of course, Home health aid is one of the few growing entry-level jobs in New York City, um, and it is um, particularly an entry-level job for low-income uh, single women. Um, and so those, it, it does end up being um, low-income single women of color who are most uh, harmed by being on the SCR. Um, not all home health aid agencies check, but a lot do. So when someone's asking you, I mean, unless you have had a particular contact with that employer, you probably can't say for certain, but I would encourage you to advise clients that it is going to be broad. So they, I, 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 people should not think, oh, I, I'm not a kid person. I'm not going to work with kids. Therefore, it doesn't matter to me. If they, it really, um, a lot of, I mean, I guess if you're, you know, if you're a lawyer, you're probably not going to be in a position where you're being checked. But really, an incredibly broad range of jobs is. Um, now, it's the, it's the case being indicated um, that is the critical, um, that's what harms your uh, right to employment. So um, we're going to talk about the various things that can end up in your record. But the key thing in terms of um, impact on employment is whether the case is indicated. If it's not indicated, if it's unfounded, which is the other alternative, it's going to stay on the hotline, but it's not going to be accessible to employers will be accessible to subsequent investigators, child protective services, or law enforcement. But it won't keep you from getting a job. So in terms of um, the concrete employment effect, the issue is, is it indicated? And if it's indicated, is it sealed or not? We're going to say more about that. But let's go on to the next slide. Um, now, also important to know, these employers who have to check actually are allowed to hire someone, even if they have an indicated case. Almost none of them know that. I mean, I've rarely met uh, the agency. In fact, ACS didn't know that they could hire parent advocates who had indicated cases, and we had to explain to them, actually, the statute's very clear. It's not a prohibition on hiring people. Um, what the law says is that they have to consider the indicated case before they offer you the position. Um, so I'd like to highlight this, but I also I don't want to give a misleading sense on it. It's important to know. They can still hire you, or they can still let you be a kinship foster parent, um, having taken into account the indicated case. And sometimes we're going to be advocating for um, employers, and, and more often, I think it's with ACS and the agencies, that someone can be a kinship resource, even though they have an indicated case. So we want to know for sure that we can always cite the statute. You're absolutely allowed to hire them if you don't think there's a present safety risk. At the same time, we would not 
want the fact that they are not prohibited from doing it to give any of our clients um, a sense that um, they're still going to be able to get jobs because the practice, those of you who have worked um, with clients who are affected by this know this already, um, there are no employers who do the analysis they're supposed to do unless they're pushed to. So they are routinely just telling people, you have an indicated case, that's it, we're not hiring you. So from a, from a risk uh, perspective or of taking care of yourself, you need to clear the record if you want to open up your employment options. Um, so, you know, I talked about how many mandated reporters there are, a growing number, and that we let anyone do it. And i just like to highlight that this is a purposely over-inclusive policy. Um, one might agree with it, one might not, but it is actually coherent in some ways. There are some ways in which it's not coherent, and we're definitely going to get into that. But it's important to understanding the whole setup, that it's purposely putting more people on um, than anyone thinks actually create a safety risk. And that, and it, it therefore puts a huge amount of weight on the appeals process to kind of weed out the people who are over-inclusively uh, put on there. Um, and um, one piece of it being over-inclusive is that unlike in some states, in New York, if what the person says when they call the hotline could possibly constitute abuse or neglect, they have to take the call. There's no screening there for, for substance. There is a screening to, they, they do have to show it would, has to be, that it could be abuse or neglect, and really what that means is they have to show that the allegation is about someone who has, is either a parent or has some kind of caretaking responsibility for the child. This is not a registry where they take calls about stranger danger. So if the allegation is, you know, a kid was sexually assaulted in a park by someone they didn't know, the hotline's not going to take it. They're going to tell them to call the police only because neglect and abuse are defined in the statute as something that a parent or someone in a parenting role has done. So the only things they're screening out are when we're not talking about, because it's supposed to be for protective purposes, not supposed to be for prosecutorial law enforcement purposes. Um, but other than that, other than saying, oh, this isn't a person in a parental relationship, um, and that can include a grandparent, a boyfriend of the, of the mother, all, all, is very broadly construed who's in that. It's only if you're out of that that they're not accepting the case. They're not doing an, assess an assessment of, is this likely to be true? Is this, um, you know, is this so mild that we shouldn't care about it? Which is a kind of assessment they do in some places. They don't do that here. They're not doing any screening out. The law requires that children's services investigate every single case where it might be abuse or neglect. Um, so um, now the call comes in, it's direct, it's taken in Albany, the, the actual um, call, but then they send it for investigation to the local child protective service um, based on county and the rest of the state. In New York City, of course, it's ACS, so I'm going to talk about ACS. Um, but it, they're directing it to whatever the local child protective service is. Um, and that agency is required to do an investigation. ACS likes to emphasize that they are absolutely required. So because they, um, when they're criticized for investigating almost exclusively families of color, their answer is, we don't have a choice. We have to investigate who's called in. It's families of color that are called in. So um, what they have to do is an investigation. They have to complete it within 60 days. Um, there are some things that are going to be optional for them to do or not do. But the thing they absolutely have to do once they get the call is they have to make a decision indicated or unfounded. It has to be one of those two. Um, I don't, unclear why it's not founded and unfounded. But it's indicated or unfounded. <laughs> um, now. The standard for getting on there, for it being indicated, is, as some of you will know, um, some credible evidence. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I didn't learn the, the standard some credible evidence in law school. I mean, it isn't taught in law school. It's, it is not really a legal standard. I mean, it's not used in any other context, right? So we're, we, um, we're all used to the beyond a reasonable doubt for criminal court, um, clear and convincing evidence for some cases where we want to make it hard to show something. And the vast majority of cases in law are handled by the preponderance of the evidence standard. Is it more likely than not? And those are the ones that we learn about in law school. 
the legislature, in their wisdom, came up with some credible <laughs> evidence thing for this. Um, and it really um, often is interpreted as anything that is no credible evidence. So you can have a little tiny bit of evidence that something happened, and really, really a lot of evidence that it didn't happen, but there's some that it did. There's no weighing of whether it's more likely than not. There's no weighing of the exculpatory um, evidence, or at least there doesn't have to be. I mean, obviously, different workers, different supervisors do the analysis differently, but under the law, this is the part about purposely over-inclusive. They are supposed to indicate it, even if there's a lot of reason to think there wasn't abuse or neglect. Yeah, I have a question. Yes. So, is it true that if you have an indicated case, and then let's say it leads to an abuse and neglect case in family court, and you get a positive disposition in that case, that doesn't affect the fact that it's indicated, because the standard is lower here? Correct. Okay. Um, and that, we will talk more about that, but it's um, the system that we have. If you have a finding in family court, then that is going to stop you, prevent you from challenging your case in the SCR because it's the lower standard, but not the other way. You can okay. win in family court, it doesn't clear your record because it's the lower standard. Um, and I, I appreciate your, your jumping in because do ask questions as we go, It'll um, rather than just letting me uh, talk. Um, so, um, so we're purposely indicating a lot of people that, that nobody uh, actually believes uh, abused or neglected a child. And because of that, it's estimated that millions, OCFS does not release the number, but they don't deny that it's millions of people on there. So clearly outside the realm of what we would normally think of, even with a pretty broad definition of neglect. Okay. And you can be on there without even knowing that you're on um, And that is very com all too common. So they're supposed to send you a letter saying you're on there, and we just know, and even OCFS doesn't dispute that many, many people don't get those letters. Um, so um, I suspect not a surprise to anyone in this room that um, it does vastly disproportionately affect people of color. Um, and um, that is both in terms of who's being reported to the SCR, as I just said a minute ago, um, that um, black families in particular, um, it's families of color, but it's, it's even more extremely black families, um, Native American families, but not. Obviously, that doesn't end up affecting New York City as much. Um, but even given the over-reporting of families of color, um, you still then have this 2.6 times more likely to be indicated. So your disproportionality is getting um, more extreme at each level of analysis. Um, uh, in terms of winning appeals, the, there is not a disproportionality for when, when um, when families of color and white families appeal, they win at the same rates, but the, the statistics show that white families appeal these SDR cases dramatically more often. Um, and, and that's actually the one place. So generally speaking, in New York City, not nationwide, but New York City, um, the, the system is targeting um, disproportionately black families, even over Latino families. The one place where we really see um, it in, in challenging and doing this appeal process that we're here to talk about that's one place where actually Latino families fall to be even um, uh, less um, uh, taking advantage of the appeal system. And we could all speculate maybe some of the, the reasons that might be. So if they appeal, um, there is not a distinct, there's not a statistical disproportionality in who's winning, but there's very much so in who's, who's appealing um, uh, these cases. Okay, so. Um, now, so that's kind of the big overview of the registry, and I'm about to jump into the law that's governing it. Any questions so far? So those of you who work in family court know most of what we deal with in family court is governed by the Family Court Act, unless we're dealing with um, termination of parental rights. But here, for um, these cases, it's almost all governed direct, most directly by the social services law. And these three sections, if you read those three sections, um, you, will, you will have the bulk of the law. Um, uh, there will be some confusing things about it because it is about the, the worst written statute ever. But you will have then read um, most of the law that is covering um, the registry and this appeals process. Um, so one of the reasons that it's very difficult to read 
um, is because parts of it have been struck down as unconstitutional. Now, that's great for our clients um, that they have been struck down. But it means that if you read the statute, it, you can't assume that what's in there is the governing law. And for reasons I don't understand, Westlaw and Lexis don't tag that. So you could read it and think it is all active law. Um, I'm going to talk about, um, well, maybe I'll talk about it right now, what, what those, the case law does most importantly. So the two big cases are Valmonte versus Bain, um, which is a Second Circuit case, and Matter of Lee TT, which is a court of, New York Court of Appeals case. Um, they, they're both making findings along the, the same lines. Um, uh, Valmonte was a class action that was brought by Lancer and Kubitschek, um, and hugely important for establishing your rights in this area. Because um, before that case was brought, you did not have the right to a hearing where, where you would get the preponderance of the evidence standard until after you lost a job. So for those who are looking at it from a legal perspective, you were getting a post-deprivation hearing instead of a pre-deprivation hearing. And so now it is required that if you ask for it, you are entitled to get a, a pre-deprivation hearing, a fair hearing, that uses the preponderance of the evidence standard before any employer is told that you have this indicated case. That's how it's supposed to work. I mean, that's what the law now says if you combine the statute and the cases. Practice, of course, is a different matter. But that's if you're supposed to get the hearing before um, anyone knows. Um, and then we're going to get more into the detail of those things. But just to round out the law, the other um, uh, governing set of regulations is um, the this, this section cited there of um, the NYCRR. Those, you know, the, these I would review. If you're going into a hearing, like you're actually going to do a hearing, I would review those because those are the ones that explain a little bit about um, the rules of evidence at the hearings, things like that, the details of it. Um, but basically, what you're looking at are, uh, is the social services law. So what does the social services law say? The first thing it says is in 412, and that's where um, they're defining abuse and maltreatment. I'm not going to spend much time at all on abuse. Um, because such a small percentage of our cases are abuse, and the legal definition matches up a little more with the common sense definition. Um, most of our practice ends, ends up focusing on the maltreatment. Um, so the social services law and all of the discussion of the SCR uses the phrase abuse and maltreatment. Unlike the Family Court Act and those of us in, in family courts who are constantly talking about abuse and neglect. But what you need to know is that even though the word is different, they're exactly the same thing for our purposes, maltreatment and neglect. They're defined by the statute for all intents and purposes. Um, it's not precisely right to say, but you can, you, you do not need to understand any sense in which they're different. They are equivalent under the law. Um, and that is really important because it means that all of the case law that we have developed coming out of family court cases about what neglect is applies to these, because you're defining neglect and maltreatment is neglect, so it's all related. Very few of the SCR cases um, end up leading to published decisions, because you have to do an Article 78 and, um, uh, and get it to the point where there was a published decision. So there, there are few, but very few. So most of the law that's governing our stuff is the law that we're also looking at when we, when we try to argue whether something is neglect in family court. And of course, Nicholson versus Scapetta is the most important piece of that. Let's go to the next um, slide. So now I know this is going to be um, old news to those of you who have been practicing um, in family court, but I'm going to go over it for those um, who are new to the field. Um, New York, um, like all of the country actually following the Federal Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act in 1974, decided to define neglect very broadly. I mean, that was a conscious choice. Um, and uh, states do it differently, but the feds basically incentivized defining it broadly. And so New York's definition is that child is neglected if, or child is maltreated if, their physical, mental, or emotional condition has been impaired or is an imminent risk of being impaired as a result of the failure of the parent or the other person legally responsible to exercise a minimum degree of care. So that's basically breaking down into two elements. I think maybe they're on the next slide, Emily. The, um, yes. So you're basically 
in order to have neglect or maltreatment, there has to be a harm element and there has to be a, a, a failure to meet a minimum degree of care by the parent. Um, this is what shows it's fault-based, right? It's not, there has to be something that the parent did. Um, but the harm piece is also very important. Now, I'm saying harm, but it's not, the harm does not have to occur. It, it could be imminent, could be threatened. Um, so uh, there, is, there always has to be a showing with respect to harm, but it can be that the harm happened or um, that there was imminent risk that the harm was going to happen. Um, we also know from Nicholson and the rest of the case law that harm must be serious. Harm is not every little bad thing that happens to a child. It's supposed to be serious harm. Um, and similarly, that imminence, that threat, it has to be, it's just about to happen. It's not supposed to be, you know, somewhere down the line that might be damaging. Um, so it's a very heightened standard, um, which now that we have real uh, representation for parents in family court has really meant we have a lot to work with uh, to push back against over-intervention. That, although the law is the same in this SCR world, um, there hasn't been the benefit of um, the high quality representation pulling back and so pushing back against um, over-intervention. So we're, we, basically we need to use some of the same tools we've been using in family court to push back on the indicated cases. Similarly on the um, minimum degree of care, the case law is um, uh, I think quite wonderful if it were followed. We um, live, live in a really nice world where the court is not supposed to say whether I think this is great parenting, I think this is how I would do it. Um, they're supposed to be looking at did the parent fall below the absolute minimum uh, floor um, uh, and um, we're not looking for ideal. Um, so both of those two elements and, and the causal connection, some people talk about three elements or two, I don't think it matters, you do have to show the causal connection. So all the things that are so um, important and interesting to litigate in family court, we also can litigate um, here on the SCR side. Um, so that's, that's the sort of starting point of what the question is supposed to be about. And now I'm going to turn to some more process issues of how we get um, the appeal going and when, when there are rights to challenge. And the big thing here, the takeaway point I said I would highlight, is that there are two windows to challenge. And there's a better one and there's a worse one. And we, we want to help our clients take advantage of the better one whenever we can. So they call the first one, um, the first thing you can ask for a 422 hearing. If you ask within 90 days of getting your notice of an indicated case, you get what they call a 422 hearing. Um, later, um, if you don't do that, later if you apply to work um, at one of the jobs that checks, you'll get a different kind of letter, what they call a 424A letter, Again, giving you a second window, a second opportunity to challenge your indicated case, and that would lead to a 424A hearing. It'd be great to remember the terminology. The terminology is not what's so important. What's important is that there is really no way for our clients to understand that this first 90-day window is much um, better for them to use. And so we want to always be letting them know when that window is, and if we can, which we, we, we often are going to be able to, expanding that window. Um, and I'm going to explain why it's so much better. But that's the takeaway is we want to help people understand they don't have unlimited rights to appeal. They have good rights to appeal, but they're not unlimited. And we want to get in that first window. OK. So when an investigation starts, the person who's being investigated, they call that person the subject, the, the clients we're representing, the parent or the, whoever's in the parental uh, role, it's called the subject of the report. And they are supposed to get a notice, a letter, at the outset of the investigation saying, there's a hotline call about you, you're the subject of the investigation, we're doing the investigation, we'll let you know how it turns out. They're supposed to get that letter at the beginning. 60 days later, they're supposed to get the letter saying, we finished the investigation, and either saying it's unfounded or saying it's indicated and you have right to challenge that it's indicated. Um, that's the letter that Zainab highlighted. Very frequently, people don't get. OCFS knows that. They don't dispute. Um, for all kinds of reasons, people often don't get it. And then there are many people who get it where it's not meaningful to them. Either, they don't, either they're not literate or they don't read English 
um, or it's just in legalese. I mean, it, it, there are all kinds of reasons why someone might get the, the letter and it not be meaningful notice. Um, uh, but the one thing the letter, if the person receives it, one thing it says is you have this right to a challenge and that you have 90 days to do it. Um, and if you take advantage in that window, you're going to have the opportunity to try to seal your record even if you don't win on, on changing it from indicated to unfounded. That's the big benefit of, of doing it in the first window or expanding when the first window is. All right, let's. So why is that? Um, because the 422 hearing, the hearing you get if you ask um, at the earliest opportunity that you have, addresses two separate questions. The first question is the question we've been focused on so far, which is, is there a preponderance of the evidence that abuse or maltreatment occurred? Um, now, if the answer to that is no, it can't be indicated. Now you get a preponderance of the evidence standards. There's not a preponderance of the evidence. No. Then your case is amended, meaning it's changed from indicated to unfounded. If they don't have the evidence, it has to be unfounded. And every unfounded case is automatically sealed. So if you win, if you convince the administrative law judge that there isn't sufficient it, evidence, it's going to be amended in case. However, if you don't convince them of that, if there is a preponderance of the evidence of abuse or neglect, there's going to be a second question. Um, and that second question is whether the indicated case is relevant to working with kids. Oh, so they all call it an R&R &R analysis, which stands for relevant and reasonably related. Um, but it, it's a relevancy analysis. Does this indicated case mean something about whether you're safe with kids? Um, and this is the one that can allow you to seal the record even if it's indicated. Because if it's not relevant to working with kids, it's sealed. Um, and that's huge for our clients. Because um, if it's sealed, as I said earlier, it's not available to employers. Now, a person might not want to have an indicated case. Of course, um, you know, it, it, there's, I, I don't mean in any way to minimize the um, <clears throat> psychological or emotional harm or unfairness of having an indicated case when you shouldn't. But it will not have dramatic, concrete effects on your life if it's sealed, because employers won't know about it. And that includes um, foster care agencies or adoptive agencies that are looking to approve it. Can't say for sure they don't know about it, but they're not taking it into account if it's sealed. Employers really won't know about it. Um, it will affect subsequent investigations. Um, so the reason, back in the day, it used to be if a case was unfounded, it was literally expunged, thrown away. There was no written record saved. But after the death, death of Eliza Escarda in 1996, they changed it so that unfounded cases are kept in the registry. That's why there's this possibility that you could have an unfounded case and seal it, because it's still in there. Um, and it is true that ACS and police, if they're investigating um, subsequent allegations of child abuse and neglect, would be able to see that. And um, it may well be that that's a fact. I mean, we all know who, who work with people investigations. It's, it is affecting subsequent investigations. But it's not having the huge direct impact on employment um, because employers are not aware of it. So getting a case sealed is just enormous. Yes. yes. So for the is maltreatment relevant to working with kids, earlier we talked about how like they're overbroad in terms of like if you're a home health aide, even if you're not specifically going to be working with kids, mm -hmm. that you could possibly, so they may screen you in that sense. So does that, it, relevance to working with kids as in like I want to work at a school but I'm going to be away from the kids, do they take that into consideration or is it just like this job could potentially put you around children? So this is a really important question because the, the the answer is that they're talking about, could it be relevant to any job working with kids? It's not specific to that job. Oh. You only get this analysis once. They are not going to consider the particular job that you're talking about, okay. which is actually you know, a negative. For the, you know, for the person who wants to be a secretary and not really have interaction with kids, they're going to be held to the same standard as if they were the sole caretaker um, uh, watching kids. So it's a one time, it's, it's, is this relevant to working with kids at all? Um, that's the bad news. The good news is that it is a broad inquiry about relevance. So it, and, it, and it looks at evidence of rehabilitation, remorse, um, 
what would typically be considered character evidence um, that you wouldn't be allowed to show. You know, you, uh, of course, can't show this is a good person, therefore he probably didn't um, uh, hit the kid. But you can use it to show you have evidence that he is a good person, that he's safe with kids in other ways, character evidence. And that can help you show it's not real. Whatever happened in a one-time incident is not relevant to working with kids. Um, there is a particular list of factors that the statute says um, that the administrative law judges have to consider. So the statute says that OCFS has to come up with a list, and they have done that. And that list is supposed to be included in every um, uh, time that a letter is sent to somebody saying that an employer is making an inquiry about them. There is a copy of that list in the manual. So everyone that got the, a link to the manual, or they will, you think? Yeah, yeah. I can send it. Yeah. Okay. It's on our key drive, um, but I can send it to um, We tried to put a lot of, lot of really helpful information in that manual. So um, I do think it, it can be useful to go to as you're working through these things, it does have that list. So if you're litigating the relevance, you always want to look at the list, you always want to make arguments about the particular things on the list, but you also want to remember it's very broad and you can bring in anything that you think um, it's persuasive to say goes to relevance. Um, uh, now, in contrast to the, sorry, yes, good. No, every unfounded report is sealed. Yeah. Um, Mostly about children. I mean, there's no clear cut answer to that, but I think from my experience, it's more about how are you with children. We'll talk about some specific examples, but I'm glad you brought up like a pastor. Oftentimes, letters from clergy are particularly um, useful. Um, and it, but if they can say, you know, I see this, this parent interacting with her own children in our congregation, or I see her interacting with other children who are in our you know, church or synagogue. That can be very helpful. Um, but it is about how you are with kids, not so much um, just are you a great person on the list. There was another, yeah. I'm wondering about situations, and if you're going to address this, sorry to jump the gun, but situations in between the 422 window and the 424A window where, say, the client never got the letter saying you're on the SCR and the 90 days runs out, but can they still? Uh, take advantage of the 422 hearing if they just never receive a notice. So we are going to, I am going to pin that for a second because we're def that's a critical uh, thing to get into and we're going to in just a minute. Let me just say to, to highlight, hope oh, maybe it's clear already, but the, the really big difference between the 422 hearing and the 424A hearing is here you're only looking at the one question about the preponderance of the evidence. You don't get a separate analysis of whether it's relevant. So if there's a preponderance of the evidence, that's it. You, you can't get it sealed if you're in 424A land. Okay. So um, I am going to get to that very soon, but just to go through some of the basics before that, um, uh, as I know some of you do routinely, sending the letter to the Office of Children and Family Services is the way to initiate the challenge process. Um, that's all you have to do. Um, so, so simply doing that is already protecting the parents' rights. Um, in a very significant way. It can be a very simple, it doesn't have to even have any magic words. We have a sample, which I, I suspect many of your offices have, that's in the manual that cites the statute and says, I want to amend and seal, which is the technical way to talk about it, and it cites the statute. But you don't have to do that. I mean, a person representing themselves can say, I want to challenge this indicated case, or this, this case shouldn't have been indicated. Whatever they say, that, that's enough to challenge, uh, to, to start the challenge process. On the other hand, there is a choice. You can do a substantive letter that makes the arguments why it shouldn't be indicated, and we're going to get into why that might be helpful. Let's go to the next um, slide. But now we are back to the question about um, the land between that initial notice and the second notice, um, particularly if you never actually received the first notice. So the notice, the 90 days that you have, starts with actual notice that you received the piece of paper. Not that you know you have an indicated case, not that a caseworker told you it was indicated, but you received a piece of paper that said your case is indicated and you have a right to challenge that. That's the notice. Um, a fair number of people do receive it, um, but really a lot of people don't. 
Um, and for sure, you can challenge, if they haven't received it, that there is no notice, and you, and you, you have to um, say that, and you have to document it, but you're gonna, you, your window will not have run. It, it's a little, it's less clear what happens if you got the notice, but it wasn't meaningful to you. The, the clinic has been looking for cases. We would be very interested in litigating. If they send a letter um, uh, to somebody who doesn't um, read English, um, particularly if they know the person is not English speaking, but in any event, if any time they send a letter to somebody who um, would not be able to read that letter, we'd like to challenge that that's not actual notice. There might even be arguments that people with certain intellectual disabilities, it wouldn't be sufficient notice. Um, okay, so let's go. Um, oh, I guess it, I thought it was going to go right. We're going to get back to the, the question of what to do in the interim. But let's. this is what I already covered about if it's sealed, um, you're really going to be protecting your client from almost all the practical consequences. Um, and I have been using, you've seen, the terms amend and seal because that is the language of the statute. Um, most of the clients that I work with and really most of the practitioners, family court judges, ACS lawyers, still use the term expungement. When they're talking about clearing somebody's record, they're often using that term expungement. So I'd just like to explain that um, expunging used to be the word that was used in the statute before that change I mentioned, where they decided to stop throwing out, literally expunging, unfounded cases and decided to start keeping them there. So now if you win, what you're getting is amending and sealing. People use the term expunging. Sometimes it's important to um, co correct that and sometimes it's not. Um, but it is important to know that really what we're almost always seeking is amending and sealing. Now there's a little caveat to that, which is there's still technically um, a right to try to expunge your hearing, but it's such a limited right that um, I, I, I like to mention it to be comprehensive, but you, you do not want to lead a client to think that when you're challenging what you're heading toward is expungement, because you're not. You're heading, hopefully, toward amending and sealing. Um, the statute says that you can get true expungement, meaning literally no record of your name in the registry, only in two ways. One, the person who made the report is convicted. Um, it is a misdemeanor to purposely file a false report. I've never heard of anyone being convicted for that. Um, uh, although I have asked the DA's office to, <laughs> to pursue it sometimes. Um, but, uh, and then the second way is if you affirmatively show by clear and convincing evidence um, that the allegation is not true, but of course you only have to think for a second about how hard it is to prove that most things didn't happen. So even in really strong cases, it's it's extremely hard to get the expungement. Have you ever even heard of anyone being charged with making a false report to the SCI? Like it's such a non thing, right? Not I've never heard of someone being charged. I mean, I, I do. I, I don't know. We had one case. The clinic had one case where they seemed to actively investigate it, um, but it's not. It, it is. It doesn't happen. I mean, it's something that maybe I, I think we should try to maybe push, you know, particularly now that we have more DAs who say um, that they want to protect the communities they're supposed to represent and be more progressive. I, I think we could push more for investigations. Um, but of course, they are going to be hard cases to prosecute in any event. So it, it's not it's not something you should rely on. I mean, we're, I, I just, I, nobody's getting this. So you need to know it's there in, because if someone asks you, is there, can I ask to have it expunged? The answer is yes. But part of the answer also needs to be, but that no one gets that. What we would really like to try to help you do is amend and seal it because that's what's going to protect you going forward. Is there an outer limit though? At which point they expunge it? Yes. So the 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 unfounded cases stay on the registry for ten years. So at the end of the ten years, then it actually is gone. Okay. Um, so you could say that's expunged um, at that point. It it is no longer in the record. Unfounded cases after ten years. Indicated cases, I should have said this earlier, stay on until the youngest child in the report um, turns 28. Um, so that, of course, means different lengths of time for different people. But you can be on, if, it, if it, the case involves a newborn, you can be on for an indicated case for 28 years. Um, you're going to be on at least 10 years, because if the child was just about to turn 18 when the allegation came in, it was, you'll be on there for 10 years. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I would. I just feel like I I would have had like cross family clients who have, like showed me like text 
message conversation where someone is like, I am going to report you to ACS mm -hmm. so that I can get XYZ thing. Yeah. So those wouldn't, that wouldn't be any kind of like convincing evidence. I mean, it might be. Uh, it might be. I'm not. I've not seen it succeed. I. I, I don't. I don't want to. Um, I, I mean, I've only tried a couple of times to get people's records expunged, and I've never. I've never gotten it. But I haven't tried a lot. Partly because I. It's not the thing that I'm interested in putting the resources into it. But you could. You. Uh, that would be the kind of thing that would be helpful. Um, uh, I. I guess I think. When, to me, your question is a little less about, um, I think it's unlikely we're going to get prosecution. If you're trying to help a person figure out how do they prevent this from happening, I do think I mean, we should be able to get, if it, particularly if there's some kind of pattern, we should be able to get the police to at least go and say to that person, I'm investigating. Um, I mean, that would be something we could push for if we thought that would shut it down. or. You know, they could get a threatening letter from a lawyer. You know, this is a this is a crime to do this, and we're going to prosecute. You know, we're going to pursue it to the fullest extent of law. But it would be more in the nature of threat. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to derail the presentation, but I wonder because that just came up in one of the, the early defense cases that um, we're working on, and um, it's very clear that it's a false report, um, and I think it's very clear who it came from. Wouldn't it be? Interesting if ACS like was the one that was making efforts to contact. We were holding them accountable to contact um, the male authorities if somebody's making false reports consistently. Do you know if there's anything like that out there or any conversations about that? Because actually the, the caseworker brought that up during the interview with the client. The client was so upset. So I'm just wondering they they're aware that they can this, right? So she's yes. admitting that she's aware. I'm just wondering if that's something that, that has, <coughs> I don't know, has there been conversation around that? So there's been, uh, there was an effort to approach OCFS. Would they work on um, trying to um, limit the malicious reporting and in short the answer was no from OCFS. <laughs> um, they don't even have, like they don't even have caller ID um, up there. Like they don't, they literally don't know where the calls are coming from. ACS, I haven't, to be honest, I haven't heard, like, you know, the, the offices all meet regularly with the commissioner. I haven't heard that be a subject conversation. Maybe it could be. I, I have heard what you're talking about, that certainly some caseworkers realize and even document in the case record that there seems to be a pattern, particularly if it's obvious that it's coming from an abusive ex-partner. Um, but, no, I don't know of any concerted um, efforts by ACS. I think it would be great if somebody wanted to, to propose um, that kind of thing. I do think that the bill to um, prohibit anonymous reporting would at least limit it a little bit. I mean, it wouldn't end it, but it, at least someone would be have, to have to give their name. And then if we went to the police and said, could you investigate? They, I mean, a lot of times now, they, they, the investigation can't go anywhere because they don't even know who it's coming from. And so, sorry. Can I just add to that? But I think part of the problem, too, is like it's not the caseworker who really has clout or who can sort of like propel any movement towards investigating that it's the CPM, and that person is literally never going to do anything in favor of our client. There is an SCR practice group that some folks in this room are part of, and, and we would welcome your joining that to, to talk about yeah. efforts to, to work on something like that. There were a couple other hands up. Did we? No. Okay. So I am going to start to talk a little faster because I'm realizing that the time is um, moving. Um, so I do want to cover what the, the overview of the review structure. When you send that initial letter asking for a review, you trigger a two-part process just with the one letter. So the first thing they're going to do um, up in Albany is a review on papers. They call it an administrative review. You don't get to appear. They're going to look at all the documentation. Um, they're going to look at what ACS sends to them as from that they want them to look at, and then they'll look at whatever you send. Um, so that's why I said you could you can do a substantive letter and include things. They will look at that. Um, if you're and here at this stage, they'll look at the two questions: Is there a preponderance of the evidence? If there is, is it relevant? And they do actually amend and seal some at this phase, just on the papers. Um, but if they don't, you automatically get the fair hearing. You don't have to ask again. That's why that first letter is so invaluable. And once you get a fair hearing, now you're talking about an in-person evidentiary hearing. Um, ACS. There will be an ACS lawyer there. Um, the, the parent 
doesn't get a free lawyer, but they can have a lawyer, and that's why it's so great that you guys are going to be able to do more and more of those. And it doesn't have to be, I'm using the term lawyer. It's a representative. You do not have to be a lawyer. Um, you can be a law student. You can be a social worker. You can be a parent advocate. You can have anyone who's there um, helping you argue, uh, but they're not going to give you a free lawyer. Um, the final stage of the process, if you lose at the fair hearing, is you do have a right to an Article 78. As you may know, that's the process to challenge in court decisions that are made by an executive branch um, office like OCFS. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about these because our chances of winning here are so low. The standard of review um, uh, is essentially an abuse of discretion standard. They need to really have violated uh, the law um, to, uh, to win here. There, once in a while it's worth doing. Um, the clinic is always happy to, to review with you whether it's worth bringing in Article 78. But this is the point. There's two places where we're helping people the most. One is helping them figure out how to access their right to challenge, just getting that letter in. That's the key first point. And then the key second point is the fair hearings, because really having an advocate um, makes it far more likely that you're going to settle, get win through settling the case, or just flat out win the hearings. So this part I'm really going to um, speed through. Um, but you're, and, and there is more on this in the, in the manual, but uh, there are several steps that you're going to want to do in, in a pre-hearing posture. So if you're getting ready, um, if you're helping someone throughout and, and you've done the initial letter, you can first send substantive information. That can be in your very first letter where you say, I want to challenge, and here are all the reasons why, or you can send that letter, I want to challenge, and then send a second letter saying, here are all the reasons, or here's the supporting documentation. You have to send that second one pretty soon, because they are going to start to look at it. But it doesn't have to be in the first one. Um, you're going to start figuring out what discovery, what records you want um, in this pre-hearing stage. Um, I put in the slides, um, and it is in the manual, the contact information. This is the woman who runs. ACS legal office that handles these. So it's different than FCLS, which is the ACS legal office in family court. She's in charge of the ACS lawyers who are prosecuting these cases. So if you need to know who's your lawyer, you can always contact her email, phone number. Um, one huge part of helping people through this process can be the negotiation, because we do settle favorably an enormous amount of these cases. And when I say settle favorably, what I mean, we're not talking about the elaborate scheme of various complicated settlements you might get in family court. Settling in these cases typically means they are, they are, they are declining to prosecute. They're not putting on a case, you totally <coughs> win. You get amend and seal. Um, and a decline to prosecute, which is practically unheard of in family court, right? I mean, the a withdrawal of a petition um, is um, a, a rare prize. But in these cases, they are used to doing it. We get it. If you actually engage in the negotiation, you are very likely to get a settlement, far more likely than a person who is representing themselves. So this is just a place where we have enormous value added. Um, and then there's a preliminary appearance is the first um, time that you're going in, still in the pre-hearing stage. They schedule these. You, the person gets a letter. They first get a letter saying that the administrative review has denied them. I mean, if they say if they get a letter saying they amended and seal it, that's the end of everything, all good. But if they get a letter saying, we did the administrative review, but we're not amending and sealing, we're going to schedule for a fair hearing. That's one letter. Then they get the next letter, which gives them the date. But it's not actually for a fair hearing. It's for what they call preliminary appearance. Um, and then at that preliminary appearance, there is an exchange of discovery. You can use it as a chance to talk about settlement. And mostly what you're doing is scheduling the fair hearing date. Um, so, fair hearings. If you've seen them in other contexts, like suspend, school suspension hearings or public assistance hearings, um, uh, NYCHA hearings, it's very similar. Quasi-judicial, we call it, because it's not a judge in the judiciary, but it is an administrative law judge. Um, the proceeding is taped. It, it, it's a little bit formal, but it's not a courtroom. Nobody's wearing robes or anything. But it does have a formal structure. Um, the burden is going to be on the state to, to prove the case, put in the evidence, so they go first. That's why if they, if they decline to prosecute, they don't put anything in, you win. We already talked about the preponderance standard. The key evidentiary um, rule to know, and as I said, it's all in that NYCRR um, section that I, that I had listed on the earlier slide, 
what the kind of technical parts, but basically, um, evidence does have to be relevant and material. It can't be overly duplicative, but hearsay is allowed. That's the big um, uh, guiding, um, defining aspect of the evidentiary rules. Um, and that means, of course, that ACS can rely on their case records because hearsay is allowed. So there is, they do rely on quite a bit of hearsay. Um, as a general rule, people don't typically give opening statements, but just like in family court, you could if you wanted to, even though it's a little unusual. Most people do do a closing <coughs> statement. Um, one thing to give your client a heads up about is it's, it, that it's different from family court. They're not even going to get a decision right there. That's not a good sign or a bad sign. They're going to finish the hearing and they'll get the decision in the mail. So, Sarah has a question. Can you request to do a post-hearing memo or no? Yes, you can. Okay. Um, so, you know, as I said earlier, like, we're kind of now with these where we were with, with family court 15 years ago, right? There wasn't a lot of serious lawyering going on serious advocacy. Um, and the practice has changed enormously. And now, like, in family court, the judges will say, you have a summation. Like, when I started practicing, like, no, but there were no summations. Um, so they're going to, uh, summations, they're not surprised by. They would be uh, a post-hearing memo. Um, they would be surprised. But um, but there, um, there's no formal rules against saying that. There's a lot of leeway. Um, and so I do think I would urge you to be as assertive. I mean, you probably you often don't want to be quite as demanding in tone. I, is my uh, recommendation. They're not as um, because it doesn't feel like a courtroom. The same level of assertiveness might be read as rude in this room, but um, but they are responsive to you know my client has a right to this, or it would be useful to your honor to to know this stuff. Um, I have. Not often, but sometimes done um, essentially legal briefs, and they've, they've taken them both in advance, like if there were evidentiary issues in advance, mm -hmm. or after the fact. So, yeah, I would encourage you to push for things even if they're not quite used to them. So, it's been my experience um, with these types of hearings that ACS typically proceeds on records, and they don't call a live witness to come in and testify as to prong one. Is there, are there challenges that we should be making to them? proceeding only on records? Should we be making constitutional challenges enforcing our client's right to cross-examine witnesses presented against them? So um, it certainly is true that they most often proceed only on case records. They sometimes have witnesses. Um, I'm hesitating how to answer that because I, I, my general message, I want to be what I, I just said here, which is this is a new area we need to be pushing. Um, so I, I don't want to discourage anything. Um, you know, we all have our own views. I don't myself think that the that there's a very strong constitutional mm -hmm. argument about a right to cross-examine in this proceeding. So it's not it's not the challenge that I'm prioritizing in general. Um, it, like I wouldn't advise. There are some things I think we should be doing all the time, right? It, just to change the practice. I don't think this is in that category. If you have a particular case um, where you're gonna win if um, they can't rely on hearsay and records, and you're going to lose if they can, you know, and you want to make it an issue, uh, go for it. But I, I am not particularly optimistic about that one. I am always happy to talk through um, with people, um, you know, what challenges they might want to make. But I know, like, I know, for instance, that Lancer and Kubitschek do recommend making that challenge every time. And, you know, they've They've achieved some you know, amazing things. So I'm not, I, I, I don't know. It's, I don't think it's a very strong argument, but you got to make your own decision. Um, there are other legal arguments that are um, crying out desperately for, like I think the right to a relevancy analysis, regardless of when you requested your hearing, um, we, we do have a very strong legal argument. The, the two cases I put up there offer a very strong legal argument. Um, like that I would make every time, that if they're saying you don't get a relevancy analysis, I would, I would just create a record, Your Honor, we think we have a right to a relevancy analysis, even though, you know, you're just going to go on from it. Okay. Um, so this is the point um, Emily just made. They're usually going just on the records. They do sometimes bring in a case worker, very rare for them to bring in anything else. On our side, um, uh, you know, we all know, we're all used to from family court, a negative inference against our clients, it's even stronger here. It's very, 
I mean, I'm not saying there aren't cases. There are cases where if it's a totally legal argument, um, you might win without the client testifying. But it's an even stronger presumption uh, or pushback from the administrative law judge if they don't hear from um, the person. Um, most often, our, our clients are our only witnesses. But you can have other fact witnesses, expert witnesses. Um, and of course, you can have relevant records. And here, the hearsay rule is going to work for us. Um, uh, on the relevancy review, um, it's generally understood that the state doesn't have the burden on that. So that once there's an indicated case and you want to say it's not relevant to working with kids, they don't have to put on affirmative evidence to that effect. Um, the only technical requirement is that they consider those factors I mentioned before. Um, here, even more important to have the client testify. I don't think I've ever seen anyone win on relevancy alone if the client didn't testify. Um, Documentation of what they would call rehabilitation, you know, the services stuff, the stuff that we show um, to get unsupervised visits and, and ACDs and things, all of that, you know, that you're cooperative and compliant is very helpful here um, on the relevancy. And, um, you know, again, similar to family court, but even more extreme, um, I do think we, we have to advise our clients whatever choice they're going to make. It's almost impossible to win on relevancy if the person doesn't say, I made a mistake, I'm so sorry, it won't happen again. It's just really hard to win without those. And so, of course, um, that means that in some cases you're going to have a really tough strategic decision. Am I fighting on the first question, that there isn't evidence of neglect, or am I totally going in on relevancy? Because um, it is going to be very hard to give them the mea culpa they want if you just challenge that neglect even happened, right? So that's, it's a more heightened version of what I think we deal with in family court all the time, but sometimes it's a very direct choice. You have to decide, am I, am I fighting on the first one or am I fighting on the second one? Because they often don't go together. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time um, on the estoppel effects of family court decisions, a question that came up earlier, you know, what happens if you have a finding in family court? Um, this is actually, the key thing to know on this, the takeaway point, um, as it were, is that if you have a finding in family court, you can't relitigate whether there was abuse or neglect. Um, however, and it's a big however, they still can decline to prosecute. Um, so you can have a finding and they can decline to prosecute and you get your indicated case amended to unfounded. So you don't want to give up, but you want to know you can't litigate it. That's the first, however. And the second, however, is you can have your finding in family court. It's keeping you from litigating the first question. It does not in any way keep you from litigating the second question of whether it's relevant. And that, again, is why it's so important. Number one message, we want to get that first window, the 422. Because if you end up in a with a finding in family court, you're not going to win on the first prong. You have to have the relevancy analysis to help the person. Um, there is a, let's go to the next. Um, one, there is a little cheat sheet that's in the manual about how do different settlements in family court match up. So like nothing in family court assures that you're going to win in, in your fair hearing, but ACDs won't stop you from doing stuff. A finding will stop you. That, that, that really technical stuff is in there if you need it. To me, that's more important. That's less important on the SCR end and more important on the advising clients about settlements, particularly if they have jobs to check with the SCR. So I would look at that cheat sheet for that purpose. Um, but the key thing to know is that winning in family court is not enough. Um, so if we lose in family court, we can't fight it over here. But we win in family court, they can still fight it over there. Um, and that's, I mean, it's for all the usual BS reasons. But, <laughs> but re the technical reason is they, they would say, um, because it's not the same parties. It, they're not a stop because OCFS is technically it's not, there's not an identity of parties. It's ACS is the party who had the chance to litigate it here. OCFS has the chance there. That's technically why it's not worth They're not a stop. From what I heard, there was a time period where, say, the parent gets an ACD in family court, the ACD expires successfully, and then we could just send the order of dismissal on the ACD over, and they would automatically concede the SCR hearing. But it seems like now lately they've stopped doing that again, and they still want to litigate even when the parent succeeds in the ACD. Right. What's your, have you experienced any patterns on that? Or? So I, I definitely, I, I think that um, the trajectory you're describing um, it, it is what I've, I've seen and, and heard about. So 
the I think that there was a dramatic change when the current person who's the head of the office, whose name was up there a few minutes ago, when she took over, um, it became uh, more difficult to get settlements, of, particularly of ACB cases, than it had been before. Um, but the other thing that happened in the timing that I have to think is relevant is, I mean, it used to be um, that nobody was doing, the clinic did a handful of these cases, Bronx Legal Services did a handful of these cases, but 18 bs weren't doing them, and at the very beginning, the institutional providers weren't doing them. So then comes a time when you get the institutional providers, I mean, there are, there is dramatically more ACBs today because of the institutional providers than there had been before. And there are dramatically more lawyers saying, there's an ACD, you should settle it. And so uh, to me, it's, it's part of that, you know, we're, we're fighting more and more, and so, you know, there's, we get more pushback at different points. Um, the SCR work group that some of us are in is, is talking about how to reach out to them and talk about could we have a better process about settlement and negotiations? It doesn't seem right that case that five years ago would have gotten a no prosecute doesn't now. Um, but I, if you are absolutely right to think it's harder now. It's not as automatic as it used to be. It still is the case that if you have an advocate on the phone, um, uh, and again, doesn't need to be a lawyer, but whatever advocate is calling on behalf of the person and calls five times and says, you really should settle this, they are much more likely. They won't automatically say, oh, ACD, OK. But if you send them all the stuff and you and you um, bother them enough, you still can sometimes get uh, them. My sense, I can't back this up with any statistics, my sense is that um, uh, ACS is more aggressive in settlement negotiations with some offices than others. And you know, that might be a, 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 something one might be proud of. I, I don't, I mean, it's not right. It's not a, I, I think that different offices get different treatment sometimes. So. Um, certainly worth pushing in various ways. Um, all right, how are we doing on time? We're, we are getting close, yeah? 48, yeah. Okay, so let me, uh, we'll, we'll keep going, but I'm gonna just try to decide. So I'm not gonna spend, this is the part about different settlements, I don't think we should. So this is critical contact information that you're gonna want. Um, certainly if you need an adjournment, this is the number you're using. It's also often gonna be the number to get a hold of that um, ACS lawyer that you want, although you can go through the, the head of the office. Um, and then sometimes uh, you're going to want to talk directly to OCFS. Um, let's go to the next. I want to come back to this. Huh. So uh, th now this is the end, because we proposed legislation, which I it's fun to talk about, but not quite as critical. I thought there were going to be some slides on the question earlier. So I'm going to come back to this point about what do you do if the person didn't get the notice? I know for sure there's stuff in the manual, the slide um, set that's in the manual on this. We already said your window didn't start if you didn't get actual notice. However, if it's a year after the indicated case and the person sends the letter or you, or you send it on their behalf, they're going to get kicked back the, the form letter that says you're too late, you're past your 90 days. Um, what you can do when you get that letter, or even in the first one to head it off if you know it's going to come, is you're going to say in the original letter, my client did not receive notice. Therefore, their, their time to request a 422 hearing has not started to run. They have a right to a 422 hearing. And there is a sample letter to this effect um, in there. A lot of times, the client has done the first letter on the, their own, and so they're getting that letter saying you're time barred. And you can do a response that says, you include those letters. Say, they got this letter saying they're time barred, but they're not. I think the best way, if you have the resources to do it, um, and why I'm so glad we have growing resources, is that the advocate writes that cover letter, and then you attach an affidavit from the client, which does not have to say a lot, but if it says under oath, I did not receive this notice, or if all they can honestly say is, I don't remember receiving this notice, or I don't remember receiving this notice, and I often had problem with my mail at that address, or I moved, or uh, you know, I, I wasn't the head of household and in control of the mail, or whatever they can say about why they might not have gotten it. But the key words are that they're saying under oath. I mean, it's, there's no uh, concrete requirement that you have an affidavit, but I have just found I've never been turned down when I included an affidavit um, from the client. So it is, I think, best practice to do it when you can. And if you do it in the initial letter, you can say, we're challenging. We know it's going to look like the window has passed, but it hasn't because they didn't get the notice. See the attached affidavit. Um, you're going to head that off. So that's the first thing, is you can prospectively, prophylactically head it off. 
The other situation, though, that I know um, that you guys find yourselves in often is the first time the person is realizing they have an SCR problem is when they've applied for a job and they're getting the later letter, the 424A letter, that says, um, an employer's done an inquiry about you, we've checked, there is an indicated case, um, and now you have a new right to a fair hearing. If you didn't do it before, you only get one bite of the apple. If you did your 422 hearing, you're not going to get another one. But most people didn't do that, so they're getting this letter, and they have a new 90 days to request a hearing when they apply for a job. Um, and so they get the hearing, and now it's scheduled, and you can tell from the letter that they get that they're being scheduled for a 424A hearing. It says 424A in it, and it says the only question that will be addressed is preponderance of the evidence. I mean, it's not accessible to lay people, but advocates would, would be able to tell from the letter which kind of hearing it is. If you get that, if you have that letter, your client has that letter, the first thing you want to do is ask them, did you ever get the original notice? Because if you didn't, the person didn't, you're going to be able to convert, is the word, 424A hearing into a 422 hearing by doing that kind of letter that I talked about. You're going to do the letter that says, this was set down for 424A, see and close, you know, scheduling that. However, my client's still entitled to a 422 because they never got the notice, see the attached affidavit, you know, two or three paragraph really short affidavit, samples in the manual, and you're going to send that up there. You can explain to the administrative law judge at the, at the preliminary appearance that this is what you're doing, you're asking to convert. But the administrative law judges don't seem to think they have the authority to convert it. You have to do that letter separately to OCFS. So you can do it. They'll adjourn your 424A hearing, let you do that. And advocates, uh, I know from all the offices, have been very successful when they do this. I I've never seen a pro se litigant be able to do it on their own. But we are able to do it. We're able to get them that better hearing if that's what's going to be important for them to have. Um, so I do like um, at the end to talk about this proposed legislation that I'm kind of excited about, but that it's perspective. So it's it it's um, if there are questions about um, the statute uh, that we're already living under, I'll take those first, and then if there's time, we'll end on the fun stuff. Any other? If you do um, write a substantive letter to challenge it with OCFS before the hearing and everything, okay. does the ALJ get whatever you sent to OCFS, if, assuming that they reject it and you get the hearing? So, uh, important question. They do get it, and even more importantly, the ACS lawyer gets it So when it's sent down to them. So it often is basically the settlement negotiation is that letter. Mm -hmm. So, But it does mean you want to be a little careful that you don't, to the extent, say, at the hearing, maybe you're going to make a really strong legal argument. But that isn't going to be what you want to emphasize in your settlement. Of course, we're more often emphasizing you know, how wonderful the client is, and they did all the services, that kind of stuff. So you might want to think about that when you're sending uh, the initial letter. Sometimes those initial letters can feel like a letter brief. Um, but you wouldn't want to say anything that's going to alienate um, the lawyer, because it is going to feed into that, and, and the ALJ will see it. Would there be any downside to not sending the substantive letter, or like, do you strategically make that decision in some way? So it is a strategic decision. Um, so one aspect of it has to do with the timing. I hesitate to write a substantive letter unless I have the records, because of course clients don't always have a full understanding of what's being said about them, and if you do a substantive letter based on their understanding, it could be off. So if you're up against the deadline on the 90 days, better just to do the form letter. Um, when I'm advising, so the clinic represents some people full on, and then other times we do a consult and they're going to represent themselves. You know, I think that some clients are able to write effective letters on their own behalf, and some clients share more than is helpful to them. And so for some clients, if they're doing it themselves, they might be better off doing a form letter. I would never want to advise a client to do a substantive letter unless I had time to talk through with them what they might say in it. Um, you know, but then for us, I mean, there are some that are so... Uh, straightforward that you might you might just do the form letter and not spend the time because it really I mean they really do I, I think about a third of the letters are actually amended and sealed um, at the administrative review phase which is a sign of that over inclusive I mean you could see this as a system that's working like we're purposely over inclusive and then we really change a lot and although the Belmonte court said you know that's we shouldn't really set up our system around dysfunction that way but um, <laughs> Uh, so, you know, some some cases it's not worth spending the time, and in others I think it really is. Certainly, if you ha if it's a case about um, 
service is done, then you want to include that in the letter. But it's a, it's a judgment call. Um, what do we have, five minutes, or are we up against? Uh, yeah, four. four minutes. So the four-minute uh, happy ending is that some of us are getting optimistic that we might have some reforms to this system that we can. <coughs> Um, have. We got really optimistic, maybe overly so, back in June when this legislation was passed by both houses um, by wide margins, and so we thought maybe we had a new law, but Governor Cuomo, I will say on tape in his wisdom, um, decided it needed some little tweaks and vetoed it uh, on a Friday night in December. So, but the governor's office has said and really seems to be following up on the idea that they want the reforms, we just need to tweak. Um, some of the logistics of the reforms, and, and the advocates who are working on this, um, led by Joyce McMillan, um, <coughs> some of you may know, uh, is a parent affected who, who has been very active in, in trying to do child welfare reform. She's led the push, and she and I and some others met with the governor's people this week. They are saying they're, we're really going to be able to get some of this done, and that it's going to look like the proposed reforms, and that's why I think it's worth talking about. Um, we are trying to change the initial standards so it won't be so ridiculously over-inclusive and there will have to be so much cleanup in the, in the appeal process that we would move to a preponderance standard right from the get-go. We would give every person a relevance analysis so that we wouldn't have this bizarre situation where if you request it within 90 days, you can show evidence of rehabilitation, but if you request it 10 years later when maybe you've been clean for nine years, you don't get the relevancy analysis, um, right? It's a system that really nobody defends. That would change. You could get the relevance analysis regardless uh, of when you had your hearing, and you, the person affected, would get to choose when is the moment for your family that you should have the hearing. Have it at the beginning if you want to, wait, do services if you want to, and request it later. Um, it would do away with the unfairness of winning in family court and having to come over here and duplicate the effort. Um, wins would automatically lead to amending and sealing. And number five, and perhaps the most exciting, it would lower that draconian 28 years for maltreatment. Still be up to 28 years for abuse, but for maltreatment, um, uh, the, the records would be automatically sealed. If you didn't have a subsequent indicated case, they would be automatically sealed at eight years for most employers and 12 years for all employers. So a huge um, benefit um, uh, from an economic justice perspective. So ca cautiously optimistic, I would say, um, if you are not yet involved in the effort behind the legislation and would like to be, let Emily or Zainab or somebody know, and we're, we're happy to have um, help and keep everybody posted with that. But um, it could be our year for some improvement in the system. Um, the last slide has my contact information, um, and I just want to say I am always happy to, I, I meant what I said, it is really um, a good thing that you guys are doing all this, I'm much happier to answer questions or provide technical support than to just be saying no to people all the time that I can't take their case. I'd rather refer them to you and then um, uh, help you on the cases to the extent I can. So do not hesitate if you have strategic questions or process questions or legal questions or you have that unusual case that you think should be in Article 78 or would want the, the clinic to co-counsel on, very open to working with all of you on that stuff. Um, thank you. Thank you.